Hello and welcome to Man's Moral Moments. Today I have something a little bit different for you in the first of my historical tie-ins with the channel and I thought I'd start out as high level as it gets with a question that divides nations across the globe. Who actually defeated the Nazis in World War II? If you ask Americans, they would tell you that it was them that rescued Europe, much to the chagrin of the British, who will inform you that it was in fact us and our plucky island spirit that saved the day. A Russian will likely tell you that actually Soviet Russia could have defeated the Axis powers all by itself, whereas a German has a good chance of telling you that it was actually Hitler's direct decisions that doomed the Nazis to failure. So who's right? Now, I'm going to be dealing with just the main combatant powers in this video, and one also has to keep in mind that the world was a very different place in 1939 than it is today. Back then, the world was still highly imperial, and those US citizens that wonder how Brits can claim to have been so influential forget that the British Empire, even with its shrinkage in the earliest 20th century, was still the largest on Earth, with almost a quarter of the planet's population as its subjects. France, Italy and Japan also had substantial empires, despite of course France being a republic at that time, and it was against this backdrop that the inhabitants of the United Kingdom judged themselves. So with that aside, I'm not including the colonial powers of these empires, but the country powers alone. That is not to derogate the influence these nations had in the conflict, they were in fact extremely important, and I will return to that later, but I'm just analysing and commenting on the United Kingdom, the USA, Soviet Russia and Germany. So let's consider Britain. So as a Brit, and as the first of the Allied powers to confront Germany, we'll start with the United Kingdom. I'll refer to it as Britain and British for the purposes of this video. Now claimants to Britain as being the main influence to victory in World War II are often based around the earlier half of the conflict. In fact, Britain was the only one of the main protagonists that was active from the very beginning of the conflict to the very end. It was Neville Chamberlain's hard line over the invasion of Poland, in stark contrast to the early policy of appeasement taken over the annexation of what was referred to as the Sudetenland, that triggered the start of the conflict, which later became known as World War II. So let's have some numbers to start with. At the outbreak of war, Britain had around 272,000 troops, about half a percent of its 47 million populace. That increased over sevenfold over the next year to 1.65 million and doubled again to over 3.25 million by the end of 1941. Compare that to Germany, who started the war with over 4.2 million. In 1945, Britain had just under 5 million armed personnel, over 10% of its population, and lost around 400,000 of them in the fighting over the course of the conflict, about an 8% casualty rate. Britain stood with France against the Nazis until the British Expeditionary Force was forced out of Dunkirk and France fell. It housed Polish fighters throughout the war and it became the seat of Charles de Gaulle's government in exile. It stood firm against the Nazis, resisting attempts to appease or dominate them. British radar technology kept an edge over the German Luftwaffe and the RAF's famous few fighter pilots kept back the continuing raids of bombers. Not only that, but Britain was not just defensive, but launched the first bombing raid on Berlin in May 1940, which absolutely incensed Hitler and made a mockery of Goering's prior promise that no enemy would ever fly over the territory of the Reich. Despite desperate requests to America, Britain was alone against the Nazis until March 1941, when Roosevelt passed the Lend-Lease Act, allowing shipment of material to the UK. This remains controversial in Britain, where many see it as akin to the US profiteering as the world started to burn. Effectively offering to sell a hose to your neighbour to put out a house fire, rather than just helping out a friend because it's the right thing to do. In fact, this phrase was used by Roosevelt himself to justify the policy to his detractors in the US. Britain wasn't just fighting for its home ground either. We pushed back and forth with Rommel and the Italians in North Africa, and dealt with increasing Japanese aggression in the Asia-Pacific theatre. Russia at this time had its non-aggression pact and seemed to be close to allying itself with Germany and the Axis powers. From Britain's point of view, 
It was the only country effectively holding back the entire fascist movement. In 1941, things began to shift as Germany attacked Russia in the summer and the Japanese attacked the US in December. Again, from a British perspective, the invasion of Russia at least gave Britain an ally, if an untrustworthy one. Its initial collapse, of course, was alarming, and Britain sent material to help the beleaguered Russian forces. In total, 4 million tonnes of war material, including food and medical supplies, were delivered during the five years until the end of the war. And unlike Lend-Lease, this was entirely free of charge. It may disappoint some Americans to know that a few months later, in May 1941, the British captured U-110 and an intact Enigma machine, breaking the code in July, long before the US even entered the war in 1942. I know it's shocking, but the movie U-571 is a Hollywood fabrication for American audiences, which actually offended a lot of Europeans. U-505 was captured by the US with its Enigma machine, but this wasn't until June 1944, less than a year before the end of the war in Europe. In fact, America's entry was viewed by some people of the time and afterwards as being reluctant, and only when events had directly involved them. Although US troops arrived in Europe in January 1942, it wasn't until July that the first US air crews began operations, and it wasn't until the end of the year before any US troops saw action against European Axis forces. The British also formed the Commandos and Special Operations Executive in 1940 and the SAS in 1941, which conducted some of the most incredible and daring raids of all time, such as Operation Chariot against Saint-Nazaire. They trained and supplied resistance forces throughout occupied Europe, disrupting important Germany research, such as heavy water production in Norway. These Special Forces raids became so successful, Hitler created the Commando Order where commandos were to be executed, whether captured in uniform or not. As the war began to turn in late 1942 and into 1943, Britain remained at the forefront in all theatres, mustering forces, marshalling plans and spearheading operations. The RAF conducted daring high-impact raids such as Operation Jericho against Amiens Prison, strikes against Gestapo buildings and the famous Dambuster missions. Heavy bombers pounded German factories and infrastructure during mass night raids, crippling the Nazis' war machine. Finally, in 1944, Britain was the marshalling ground for the final invasion of occupied France that would spell the end for Hitler. It was British ingenuity in making the so-called Hobart's Funnies, specially adapted tanks for mine clearance, amphibious assault, sand coverage, bunker destruction and bridge laying, to name just a few, that enabled rapid advance over the fortified beaches. Operation Market Garden secured vital river crossings in the lowlands, and 17-pounder equipped British Shermans were able to deal with German heavy armour that the normal US Sherman tank couldn't compete with. Simply put, without Britain there would have been no D-Day, no victory in Europe. Her tenacity, technological innovation and support of others kept the flame of hope burning when the world was at its darkest. On the other side of this, Britain was hugely reliant on her empire for materiel, which is why the Battle of the Atlantic was such a crucial one. Lend-Lease came at a time when Britain was being ground down, and combined with the German attack on Russia and most of its attention being on the Eastern Front, and the full entry of America into the conflict in 1942, this released a huge amount of pressure on an island already pushed to its limits. Few people realise just how close the RAF fighter defence came to being wiped out, and whilst it's unlikely Operation Sea Lion, the codename for the German invasion of England, would have actually ever had success, air superiority for the Germans would have had major implications for the British, and she would have likely had to alter her robust stance at some point if the noose had tightened further on her supplies. Certainly, Britain would not have been in a position to invade Europe and push the Nazis back by herself. Her achievements and involvement were certainly hugely impactful, but she couldn't have won the war by herself. Without others' help, Britain would likely have survived, probably broaching some agreement with an established German Reich to keep parts of its empire in a new, darker world order. Sadly for me then, Britain is out. I visited Germany at the end of the 20th century and went to a World War II museum in what had been East Berlin. It wasn't called a World War II museum, however, at the time, it was called the German-Russian Museum Berlin, 
and it's now called the Museum Berlin Karlshorst. This gives an insight into the Soviet-Russian view of what it calls the Great Patriotic War. It was a war between Russia and Germany. Other countries were just bit players and sideline acts. Let's look at the numbers to work out why. In 1939, Russia had some 11 million in its armed forces, a staggering number. These, however, were deployed across a vast distance. Russia had been involved in no less than 27 conflicts between World War I and the invasion of Poland, geographically spread from Finland to Japan. In addition, Stalin's purges in 1937 to 1939 and the later one of 1940 to 1942 made much of the Soviet army a disorganized mess by the time of the German invasion. Despite this inward, and at the time unseen, weakness, the great Soviet bear was not a force to be trifled with. As shown by the number of conflicts it had been involved in, it backed its words up with force, either as an imperial or a Soviet power. This led to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939, where Russia and Germany agreed they would not attack each other and secretly divided the countries that lay between them. Germany claimed Western Poland and part of Lithuania, whereas the Soviet Union was going to occupy Eastern Poland, the Baltic States and part of Finland. Now, of course, all of this was bluster on Germany's part, as Hitler always intended to destroy what he saw as a Jewish Bolshevist state. And he wanted to continue with the 19th century drive towards the East policy. He asked for plans to be drawn up for a Russian invasion as soon as France had fallen. A year later, Wehrmacht launched their offensive into the East. This exposed the hollow state of the Russian army as vast swathes of land fell rapidly to inexperienced Russian officers who had no idea how to handle the German offensive. Russia, however, is a vast land, and the Soviets simply moved production facilities further east and called up more men to fight, almost 30 million of them. New officers and generals rose out of this, such as General Zhukov, and Russian technology, far from being inferior, often came as a nasty surprise to the German army, in forms such as the T-34. So much so that the Germans specifically designed the Panther as a counter to it. The Russian response to German aggression was absolute, with soldiers told to fight until the last. Stalin once famously claimed that there are no Soviet prisoners of war, only traitors. And in fact, if you were released as a prisoner of war back to Russia, you were sent to a special filtration camp. Most of the inmates were released back to normal service, but around 10% were sent to special penal battalions for hazardous, if not suicidal, frontline duties such as mine clearance. Soviet military losses were higher than any other nation in World War II, with around 10 million dead, almost 30% of its total military by the end of the war. To put that into context, that's more dead than the entire armed forces in Europe of the Allies combined. Not the casualties of those forces, the actual combined fielded men and women. No other nation engaged the Nazis as completely as the Soviets. The Soviet steamroller crushed Wehrmacht forces through dogged determination, as exemplified by the siege of Stalingrad. As many Soviet soldiers died in this one city as British and American forces died during the entire war in all theatres. The scale of the conflict in Russia is hard to comprehend, as shown by battles like that of Kursk, the largest tank battle in history, with over 6,000 tanks involved. Not only was it the immense weight of men and material that the Russians used, but its quality too. Russian tank development was superior to both the Germans and the Allies in a number of ways, the T-34 made extensive use of sloped armour, coupled with the F-35 gun, an aluminium engine, and Christie suspension that was rejected by the US Army previously. It was widely regarded as better than German Panzer 3s and 4s, Heinz Gudelain saying that they were vastly superior, and German General von Kleist calling it the finest tank in the world. In the air too, Russian aircraft improved dramatically with the Yak-9, Yak-3 and LA-7 all proving superior to their German counterparts, so much so that German pilots would actively avoid combat with the Yak-3 completely. Russian industry also simplified production throughout the war to allow for reduction of cost and increase of speed. 
The T-34 as produced in 1943 were functionally identical to those made in 1941, but cost half as much, and with 1,300 being made every month. In total, almost 60,000 T-34s were made during World War II, with almost as many being destroyed as there were Shermans made. There are even stories of T-34s being driven straight out of the factory, unpainted, to enter combat. The Soviet army was the one to capture Berlin and effectively end the war. It was them who dismantled the Nazi emblems in the capital, their troops holding the Soviet flag over the ruins of a defeated enemy. This would have happened without the D-Day landings, the unstoppable tidal wave of determined men, women and material proved just too much for the Nazis. Only that skims over some very pertinent facts in the earlier parts of the war. I only touched on it to start with, but the Soviets were originally on the wrong side of this conflict. Indeed, it was only a matter of months prior to the invasion of Russia that Stalin had actively tried to join the Nazis in their Axis coalition. Stalin's doctrine of not one step back cost the lives of an enormous number of men and women. Numbers before were only military, not civilian, and his policies would lead to the Cold War and more crushing conditions for ordinary people all across the East. In addition, Russia lost vast tracts of its arable land when the Germans first invaded. As we know from recent events, Ukraine is a huge grain producer, as are similar lands around it. It's not widely known and wasn't widely publicised by the Communist Party after World War II, but most of the US supply of material to Russia was in food, strategic and logistic provisions. 4.5 million tonnes of food, 60% of aviation and 90% of high-octane fuel used by the Soviets came from the US. Almost half a million trucks, 2,000 trains and 53% of the total domestic consumption of ammunition, artillery shells, mines and assorted explosives did too. The British supplied 7,000 aircraft, 5,000 tanks, 5,000 anti-tank guns, 27 naval vessels, 1,500 radars and one and a half billion dollars worth of aviation engines and more. Put simply, Russia was supported through its initial onslaught by the Germans, by its allies. Without them, it wouldn't have had the ability to resist the onslaught long enough to be able to mobilize the vast Soviet force. It's difficult to fight when you're starving and with no fuel for your aircraft or shells for your artillery. So I'm sorry to any Russian watchers, but it's not Russia either. <laughs> At the start of World War II, America's army was pretty small. Smaller than that of Portugal in 1939, in fact. In fact, it was also so poorly mechanised that in the Louisiana manoeuvres in September 1941, just a few months before it entered the war, it used trucks with the word tank painted on their sides because it had so few armoured fighting vehicles. A couple of years later, by the time America actually entered the conflict, it had about 1.8 million service personnel, and by the end of 1942, it had caught up with Britain, with about 3.9 million. At this point, though, US mobilisation was in full swing, and it more than doubled that number in 1943, rising to a whopping 12.2 million in 1945. The majority of these, however, around 75% or three quarters, were deployed in the Asia-Pacific conflict against the Japanese, and not in Europe meaning about 3 million were present in the conflict against the Nazis, or about 2 million less than the British. Despite this disparity, the US had an incredible capacity for production. A B-24 Liberator rolled off the assembly lines every 63 minutes. America launched more vessels in 1941 than Japan did in the entire war. Shipyards turned out tonnage so fast that by the autumn of 1943, all Allied shipping sunk since the beginning of the war had been replaced. In 1944 alone, the United States built more planes than the Japanese did from 1939 to 1945. By the end of the war, more than half of all industrial production in the world would take place in the United States. Now, an M4 Sherman tank was vulnerable to many German anti-tank guns at over a mile, and pretty much all of them at about 500 metres or more, 
whereas the reciprocal threat range for its standard 75mm gun to a German tank was about 0 to 200 meters. However, tank battles in Europe were not really fought over huge planes, except in Russia, so penetration statistics are not really as relevant as many would like to believe. The fact is that Germany made 25,000 tanks of all types during the whole war. The US made twice that many Sherman tanks alone, producing about half of those for Britain, Russia and China, whilst retaining the others for its own use. In total, it made 120,000 tanks from 1942 to 1945. So arguments of armour penetration, or which tank was better, become irrelevant when you're outnumbered 5 to 1 by just one of your enemies. Criticisms of US disinterest in the war during the early years are understandable, but so are the defences. Memories of troops dying in a European conflict were still present in the late 1930s in memory's minds. Many communities in America had ancestors from different countries in Europe, including Germany, and jumping in at the outset would have been political suicide for Roosevelt. Roosevelt himself did what he could to support Britain, with Lend-Lease being the politically acceptable arrangement until the end of 1942 when the gloves were really off at Pearl Harbour. While it's not free, the material provided to Britain, Russia and the other allies was never fully recouped in costs, and it wasn't returned. In the air, it was US bombers that faced the Luftwaffe during the day, paying a heavy price. The US lost almost as many aircraft in three years as the RAF lost in the whole war, and losses in Europe were more than twice as high as in the Pacific. The US also demonstrated the dominance of the aircraft carrier over the battleship, setting out the future of naval power to come. It produced some of the finest military strategists and tacticians of the war that allowed this power to be wielded to defeat a much more battle-hardened enemy at the Battle of Midway. Its troops showed grit and determination throughout all the theatres of war, and they were involved in some of the bloodiest battles. Omaha Beach is an obvious example, but still emerged victorious. America also learned rapidly from the war, and they put this learning into practice and production quickly too. Aircraft like the B-17, the B-24 and B-29, the Mustang, Thunderbolt and Lightning, armoured fighting vehicles like the Jackson, Sherman and Pershing were all practical answers to problems that saw rapid development and implementation into their formidable war machine. The US also conducted their share of daring one-off operations, such as the famous Doolittle raid against Tokyo. In Europe, Eisenhower was in overall command of Operation Overlord, the liberation from Nazi occupation. US forces pushed back heavy German resistance in key locations such as St. Lo and Avranches, and dealt with the German counteroffensive in the Falaise Pocket, known as the Battle of the Bulge. Put simply, America financed, supplied and delivered the victory against the Nazis, and went on to defeat the Japanese in the Pacific. In doing the latter, they also developed devastating new weapons that would shape the world for the future. How could it not be America that was the most influential? Well, let's go back to the British gripes and America's late coming to the conflict. If Japan hadn't attacked Pearl Harbor, at what point would America have become formally involved in what it generally saw as a European war? If Britain fell and Japan secured the Asia-Pacific region, would it have entered conflict with them without aggression or formed a pact with them? How can you claim to be an ideological victor when your motivations are so ambiguous? What ifs aside, it's clear that America's main focus was on the Asia-Pacific theater, with 75% of its war effort focused there. Europe was a minor part of things, and it's debatable whether Lendley saved Europe or merely shortened the conflict. Russia relocated its factories east after all, and ramped up production, Lend-Lease was just a stopgap. Many innovations or victories that Americans believe to be theirs are fabrications of post-war Hollywood retellings, which sold well to home audiences, but perpetrated a rather biased view of the conflict. If the British had not held firm in the early part of the war, there would have been no point for the US to base their troops from or become involved in the European conflict. The British could have retreated to their borders and survived without Lend-Lease, if not able to take the fight to the enemy. So I'm sorry, American viewers, but it's not you either. So let's have a look at the wild card here, a Nazi Germany itself. Why do a significant proportion of Germans think that they were primarily responsible for losing the war? Well, they have a point. 
That point is Hitler himself and the Nazi ideology. Nazism, like many fascist and authoritarian regimes, was based upon the assumed superiority of one group over others, with the demonization and dehumanization of some groups as a consequence. We all know about the Nazi persecution and murder of Jews, but they also went after other minority groups and races such as Romanis, Sinti and Blacks. Slavic people, such as those from Poland and Russia, were considered Untermensch and were targeted because they lived in areas needed for German expansion. The Nazis wanted to maintain and improve the supposed Aryan purity of the population and so persecuted people they deemed to be disabled, either mentally or physically, as well as gay people. Political opponents, primarily communists, trade unionists and social democrats, as well as those whose religious beliefs conflicted with Nazi ideology, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, were also targeted for persecution. This ideology of superiority, exclusion and hatred had many consequences above and beyond the obvious ones of concentration camps and atrocities. Initially, during the rise of Nazism in the 1930s, it caused a lot of very talented members of these groups to flee to other countries. Henry Kissinger, Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, to mention just a few of the most recognisable, but there were dozens more who won Nobel Prizes and other accolades in their fields. Hundreds, maybe thousands of other talented but less famous people fled the darkening skies of Europe in advance of the war too, and this huge talent drain weakened Germany's potential during the conflict. During the initial invasion of the Soviet Union, many people saw the Germans as potential liberators, so harsh had their treatment under Stalin been. If the Nazis had embraced this, they might have incited a general uprising in Russia, maybe even a civil war or at least a fracturing of unity amongst the defenders. Instead, it employed a scorched earth policy, telling its soldiers that the Slavic peoples were not equal to them as men, and they didn't deserve humane treatment. This consolidated the people of Russia against Hitler, playing into Stalin's hands to cause a sadly mistreated people to rally around their former brutalizer and swamp the Germans with their weight of numbers. Without this fanatical ideology and this mass exodus of brilliant minds, the war could have very well evolved very differently. Can you imagine Hitler with atomic weapons instead of the US? But of course, without its extreme views, war would have been very unlikely. The very spark that set the fire also denied it the means to fully realize its potential. Even so, Nazi Germany in 1939 was hugely potent so why this idea that Hitler himself pressed the self-destruct button on his own dreams? Well, if you examine Hitler's direct influence on major events during the war, he certainly had a very negative effect on many German offensives and campaigns. It was his arrogance and miscalculation in thinking that the British would not join the conflict over an insignificant country like Poland that started the major conflict off in the first place. During the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe's continued and sustained campaign against RAF targets was working, grinding fighter command into the dirt, exhausting pilots and destroying aircraft that it could ill afford to lose. It wasn't until a single lost bomber dumped its bombs so it could go home, unknowingly dropping them on a London housing district, that things began to change. Churchill's anger at the perceived targeting of civilians led to the famous 100 bomber raid and Hitler's rage at that caused his direct order to switch the Luftwaffe from its continued targeting of the RAF objectives to destroying London in what became known as the Blitz. Whilst horrific for many, this actually gave RAF Fighter Command the small amount of breathing room it needed to replace aircraft and exhausted pilots and push back the Luftwaffe air offensive. These personal interventions for Hitler's ego continued throughout the war, the Siege of Stalingrad being another famous one in which millions died over two megalomaniacs' egos because a city was assigned to the name of one of them. Germany's actual goal in southern Russia was to capture and secure the oil fields that the German army so needed to fuel the rest of the conflict, rather than having to rely on its own limited and synthetic resources. Had it concentrated on actual strategic objectives, instead of allowing its leader to participate in a contest of manhood measurement, once again, very different outcomes could well have resulted. Even the decision to design a superior tank to the T-34, rather than just copying its general principles, 
because no Slavic people could do better than the great Aryan race, of course, meant 18 months of production and continuing with the Panzer 3s and 4s that were already outclassed when they first met the T-34. The Panther was arguably the best medium tank of the war, but it took too long to design and build, and its complexity meant troubles in reliability and serviceability that its production numbers just couldn't compensate for. The T-34 had a lot of issues too, but when you make so many of them that it doesn't matter if 20% of them don't work first time or even at all, that's the point. There are many more examples, but even so, Germany forced its way beyond its borders and proved immensely effective in combat. It had a slick and well-oiled propaganda machine, it had prepared for a war in a way most of its opponents had not, and even with its hateful ideology and flawed leadership, it achieved incredible military domination in a very short space of time. Even as the tide turned against it, assaulted on all sides by a vastly numerically superior enemy, it was a dangerous and effective adversary, fighting for every inch of the territory it had claimed. Despite all the flaws of its political movement and its leader, it can't be said that the Nazi machine wasn't effective. It proved unfortunately deadly for far too long. As such, it can't be said that Nazism was the primary cause for defeating itself. So at this point, you must be wondering where we've arrived at. So far, the Brits, the Americans, the Soviets and the Nazis themselves have all fallen short of being primarily responsible for the defeat of Nazism. So who was? Well, it's actually deceptively simple. And the answer is this. We all were. We couldn't have done it without each other. The British needed help to take the fight to the Nazis. The Americans needed the British to hold back Germany until it could enter the war. The Russians needed British and American supplies to allow it to fight back until it could sustain itself and engage its true might. The Allies all needed each other at some point to be able to add their own strengths into the main effort, and they all needed the Nazis to unify them against their cause and Hitler's ego and mistakes to give them opportunities needed for their militaries to engage them effectively and exploit. So who beat the Nazis? We did, collectively. No one nation can truly and honestly claim ownership of the Nazi defeat. The Yanks didn't save Europe, the Russians didn't unequivocally steamroll at the Wehrmacht, and Britain didn't hold moral superiority over everything. We all did our part, and without any one of them, the conflict's length and outcomes would be uncertain. Post-war propaganda and the shadow of the Cold War have coloured a lot of our understanding and perception of that time, but if there's one lesson that should come through for us all today, it's that we're all connected. We're all in this world together, and it's only through viewing ourselves as global citizens and working with each other that we're going to progress. Looking at ourselves as cultural islands, as somehow different and often superior to others who speak differently or talk differently to us, is a road that ultimately leads to conflict. That doesn't mean we have to be the same in some sort of homogenous omni-culture. Quite the opposite. I find one of the most interesting things about travelling is learning about other places, other cultures, how that environment has shaped the practices and views of those living there. It doesn't mean I can't share a joke with an American or a German or a Russian about our respective countries and the cultures within them, and the differences without being respectful as well. In fact, Understanding different points of view and working toward a mutual goal, despite those differences, is one of the greatest things people can do, and one of the signs of a progressive and evolving society. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this first of my historical series. Future ones will be much more focused on modelling subjects, but I thought a generalised review of the world's largest conflict to date was appropriate, given how many of us enjoyed representing subjects from it and it still holds such a dominant place in our collective consciousness. I hope you all had a truly restful holiday period and that 2023 brings an end to many of the conflicts we see in the world today, including the one in Ukraine, and that you all enjoy many modelling moments of your own within it. Thanks for watching. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, 
which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.